You are listening to the Daily Homily for Magdala in the Holy Land. In those days when there again was a great crowd without anything to eat, Jesus summoned the disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will collapse on the way, and some of them have come a great distance. His disciples answered him, Where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? Still he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They replied, Seven. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said the blessing over them and ordered them distributed also. They ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over seven baskets. There were about 4,000 people. He dismissed the crowd and got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanuta. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's start with the miracle because we are here at the Sea of Galilee and the location is specified it's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And then it's also specified at the end that Jesus comes back here, to this side. And there's actually the Benedictines, we're celebrating St. Scholastica today. Uh, they have an altar at the multiplication of the love site in Tabka, just at the foot of the Mount of Beatitudes, at the edge of the water. And there they have, uh, they call that altar Dalmanutha. Now obviously that's not a proof that that's Dalmanutha there. There are even some scholars who suggest because of the way language evolves and sometimes names get corrupted, get uh, changed, damaged. Uh, you can hear the word Dalmanuta in Migdal Nun, Dalmanuta. So that's a theory that is sometimes forwarded. I'm not sure how, uh, if it's possible to count on that 100%, but at least it's a valid academic proposal. So then we have the miracle and Jesus' compassion, which is very moving. And this is uh, wonderful because it's the, it's the whole purpose of the incarnation, why God became man. He loved the world so much he gave his only son. He comes on a mission of love, a mission of life, a mission of restoring life to multitudes, to the whole of humanity. And he comes asking us, because that's the law of the incarnation, the law of humanity is none of us makes ourselves. None of us, even Jesus didn't. He had his mother Mary, and Joseph provided, and he received education, and he grew in wisdom, age, and grace, and a lot of people were involved in that process. So he involves us, and he wants our loaves and fish as few as we have, as precarious as our situation may be. Another little thought just crossed my mind as I was reading this right now. I wonder if anybody has speculated how many, how big were the loaves at that time? And how many people would have been in the group where they would have seven loaves? Would a loaf be good for three or four or five? So just a thought. So it's very concrete. It could also have symbolic meaning. The other side is also often referred to as other from this side, in the sense that this was a Jewish side and over there was pagan side. Going to the other side may have that implication. And so we look today at a world that sometimes we see as the other side in a condemning way. They are not with us, they are outside. And Jesus goes to be with them. Jesus goes to bless them to give them food. They're coming looking for him as well in different situations and different stages of their life. Jesus is, and his disciples, go to bless the others who are on the other side. 
to bring them goodness. And even in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, we have God blessing and bringing his rain on the fields of the good and the bad alike. Because God wants them to continue feeling that he is on their side. That he is not to be considered alien to them because they have sinned, because they are not part of the chosen people. They can also be reached. Their door is open for them to come in. And I would like to spend a little word on the first reading because actually today, after many, many weeks reading the Old Testament readings, uh, the whole story of the judges and the kings, and we did actually the earlier books as well this year, uh, from Genesis onwards. And so we have reached this point where a people has been established, a kingdom has been established, they have come into the promised land, and now they're getting corrupted. It's a very big arc of history. And here we see a very concrete expression of the corruption today in this reading. After so many blessings and how it goes downhill so quickly, how easy it is to build up and how quickly it disintegrates. And even the Benedictines found that it's probably the longest serving, lasting, living order, at least in that magnitude, with such a record of incredible service to humanity. I remember a book in the seminary that we read, and one of the features of the book was that the origins of democracy were very much helped forward in Europe through the chapter discipline of the Benedictine monasteries. And all of the monks met, and there was a specific rule in Benedict's rule that even the youngest monk, the newest arrived monk in the monastery, had voice. He could express his opinion, his take on the reality. And this became a cultural reality in their schools, in their education, in the transformation of Europe. And since Scholastica also obviously in their rule had similar um, provision. It's really amazing to see the arc of development in a people freed from slavery in Egypt where the golden calf was worshipped. They would make a golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. And this is what we read about today as well in the psalm. They made a calf in Horeb and adorned a molten image. And they would make it again at this point and from the wisdom of Solomon straight to Jeroboam. And the corruption of the kingdom already developed within Solomon's heart and life. How fragile we human beings are. And if we look at the course of the history of Jesus' community of disciples since the beginning, we've had corruption. There was even a couple who cheated on the land they had sold and pretended to give all the money to the apostles. So even the Benedictines got corrupted. There's only one order in the church that's proverbial, never reformed because never deformed. They're the Carthusians. And how is that possible? That we get so corrupted and how is it possible to stay faithful? And a major, major part is to have living, vital, vibrant prayer life, the communion with God. And the distraction of the gold, of the material, letting our hearts be taken in by that. Let us pray in this Mass for God's favor for his people, that we will be renewed each day in our commitment and love and consecration to him. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Magdala, follow us on YouTube and on Facebook. 